זה חלק מתהליך הלימוד של כנסים וירטואליים. אז שלום לכולם פעם נוספת, וברוכים הבאים לכנס מיטל ה-18. אני פותח את כנס מיטל כבר חמש שנים. בעבר הייתי צריך להסביר מדוע הטכנולוגיה חשובה להוראה אקדמית טובה, הרי אפשר גם בלי. השנה בלי טכנולוגיה לא הייתה הוראה אקדמית. הסבר קל ומוחשי לחשיבות הטכנולוגיה, לחשיבות קהילת הטכנופדגוגיה ולחשיבות מיטל. מיטל תפקידה לתמוך בקידום הטכנולוגיה בהוראה בהשכלה הגבוהה. בחודשים מרץ עד מאי התקיימו במיטל 12 מש... מפגשים בהשתתפות 1,500 משתתפים שדנו בקיום ההוראה מרחוק על היבטיה השונים וחוברו שישה ניירות עמדה לטובת אנשי הטכנולוגיה והפדגוגיה במוסדות. מיטל אם כן יצרה קהילה תומכת ומשתפת כדי לקיים ולשפר ההוראה בזמן אמת, בזמן משבר. אסור לשכוח שתקציב מיטל ביחס לתפוקות נמוך, והוא נסמך על הקהילה במוסדות. אני מקווה שגם הרגולטור שראה מה קורה יירתם כעת לשפר את הגוף השיתופי של ההשכלה הגבוהה את מיטל. אני רוצה להודות לצוות מיטל ומחבה שעמדו באתגר. לאלי מנהל מיטל, לאודליה המנכ"לית שלנו, לחיים ראש מחבה ולצוות מיטל. אני מעביר את הפודיום לאלי מנהל מיטל. בבקשה. בוקר טוב לכולם, אני מקווה שרואים את המצגת שלנו. אנחנו מאוד מתרגשים לפתוח את כנס מיטל ה-18, טכנולוגיות למידה. השנה אנחנו עושים את הכנס באופן מקוון, ואני מקווה שזה יהיה מוצלח, ונהנה ממנו כולם, בעיקר לאור השינויים או האתגרים שאנחנו כולם עוברים בתקופה האחרונה. וזה עוד איזושהי הוכחה לנו ולעצמנו, לעצמנו שזה הכנס המקוון יכול לעבוד או לעבוד בצורה קצת אחרת ממה שאנחנו רגילים, ונקווה שגם יהיה מוצלח. אני רק מזכיר לחברים, מיטל זה מרכז ידע לטכנולוגיות למידה, יש פה לא מעט חברים חדשים במפגש הזה, והמטרה המרכזית היא לקידום את השימוש בטכנולוגיות למידה בקרב מוסדות להשכלה גבוהה בישראל. חברות במיטל תשע אוניברסיטאות וכ-20 מכללות, המספר הזה גדל בעיקר בתקופה האחרונה לאור הפעילות של מיטל מול המוסדות שהיה מאוד משמעותי ודומיננטי. מיטל מחולקת לשלושה תחומים מרכזיים, טכנולוגיות, קהילה, פיתוח והדרכות ועוד שלושה תחומי משנה של תשתיות, מחקר ומידע ופרויקטים בינלאומיים ובכל אחת מהפעילויות האלו מיטל מקדמת לאורך השנה מגוון רחב של נושאים. תחת נושא הקהילה אנחנו מפעילים קבוצות עבודה מגוונות, הן משתנות משנה לשנה או בהתאם לצרכים, סביבות למידה ב-LMS, במודל, טכנולוגיות חדשות, וידאו והפקת קורסים וצוותים מובילים שמקדמים את נושא המחקר והמידע, הטכנופדגוגיה, היגוי זכויות יוצרים, Learning Analytics וכולי. כך, נראה, כך נראים המפגשים שלנו ביום יום, כשאנחנו עושים את זה פנים אל פנים, וזה כבר ארבעה, חמישה חודשים כבר לא עשינו את זה במודל הזה, כמו כל האחרים. סל הטכנולוגיות של מיטל הוא מאוד מגוון, נוגע בהמון תחומים, אתם מוזמנים, כמובן שהדברים האלה זמינים לכל החברים במיטל, למסעות החברים, סל הטכנולוגיות הוא משתנה, הוא מאוד עזר לנו בתקופה האחרונה בעידן הקורונה, הוא היה בסיס מאוד טוב למוסדות, ותכף נראה קצת נתונים על לגבי הפעילות הזו. אני רוצה לספר על מה שעבר עלינו בחמישה, ארבעה חודשים האחרונים, ובעצם היו שלושה אתגרים מרכזיים. האתגר הראשון היה למצוא פתרונות למוסדות ולנסות לעזור ולסייע בכלים טכנולוגיים שיסייעו למוסד לעבור מה-face to face או מהלמידה בקמפוסים אל הלמידה המקוונת. 
השלב השני היה, שהוא לא פחות מאתגר, זה למצוא את הפדגוגיות המתאימות, את דגמי ההוראה המתאימים ואת הכלים הנכונים כדי להפוך את הלמידה ליותר משמעותית. והשלב השלישי, שבימים האחרונים כולנו נתקלים בו שוב, זה כל נושא הבחינות וההערכה מרחוק, שעולה ממש בצורה דרמטית בימים אלו. קצת רקע וקצת לראות את הנתונים של מה שעברנו בתקופה האחרונה, אבל בגדול מיטל מיד הכניסה לסל הטכנולוגיה מגוון רחב של טכנולוגיות שייתנו מענה. ואם אנחנו רואים פה את המספרים, דרך אגב חלק גדול מהדברים מופיע גם בדוחות, בברכות, יש שם את הדוחות שצירפנו, בדף הברכות של הכנס. ונתנו מענה ל-28 מוסדות להשכלה גבוהה בתקופה של פחות מחודש. ומעל 25 אלף מרצים בעצם, שכל אחד מהם ניהל קורס במוסדות להשכלה גבוהה, והמספרים האלה הם, הם מאוד משמעותיים, ובפרק זמן של שבועיים-שלושה השתדלנו במיטל לתת מענה לקבוצה הגדולה הזאת של המוסדות. פתרונות נלווים ופתרונות נוספים כמו אתר הנגשה והמון מידע, אבל זה עיקר הפעילות בשלב הראשון, ואלה הכלים ששילבנו תוך כדי הפעילות. ומהר מאוד הבנו שאנחנו צריכים גם לתמוך בכל נושא הטכנופדגוגיה, או לנסות ולהעלות את זה לאיזשהו דיון משותף בקהילה, וקיימנו עשרות מפגשים אונליין במשך התקופה הזאת, גם לפני, אבל גם בעיקר במשך התקופה, מקוונים, כדי, כדי לדון ולבחון איך אנחנו משפרים את הפדגוגיה ואת הלמידה, וזה הנושא שמיטל קידמה בחודשים האחרונים. יש מספרים בדוחות שצירפתי בדף הברכות. וככה זה נראה ממגוון המפגשים שלנו. השלב השלישי שכרגע נמצאים, כולנו נמצאים בעיצומו, למרות שניסינו לתת לו איזשהו מענה תוך כדי תנועה. להערכה חלופית, הערכה מעצבת ובאמת לעבור מהערכה, מהמבחנים אל הערכות, הערכה קצת שונה ויותר מותאמת וזה נושא שאנחנו כרגע עדיין נמצאים בעיצומו ואני חושב שהוא ילווה אותנו בחודש, חודשיים הקרובים וכמובן שבהמשך יש לנו מגוון נושאים שאנחנו נמשיך ולטפל בהם שמיטל תטפל לשנה הזאת, בהרחבה של סל הטכנולוגיות, פתרונות סינכרונים, אסינכרונים, כלים משלימים וכולי, כולכם נתקלתם בזה בתקופה האחרונה, אנחנו נמשיך ונבחן את זה. דגמי הוראה עדכניים, איך אנחנו הופכים את הלמידה למשמעותית, למידה עדכנית, ומחקר עדכני שבוחן מה עברנו כאן, אני חושב שהיום הזה, יום הכנס הזה, נוגע בהמון המון נושאים סביב הפעילות הזו. ואנחנו נמשיך ונעשה את זה בתקופה הזאת, אנחנו כמובן קוראים לקהילה להצטרף אלינו. מה יהיה לנו היום? יש לנו מגוון רחב של מושבים, מעל 12 מושבים מקבילים, יש לנו את הרצאת הפתיחה שתהיה מיד אחריי בתשע וחצי, יש לנו של דונלד קלארק, קלאר, שידבר על נושא ה-AI בהשכלה גבוהה, באחת יש לנו מפגש עדיין מליאה, מפגש מליאה עם פרופסור שזף רפאלי ובסוף היום בארבע וחצי יש לנו פאנל סיום שהמנחה הוא אהוד אור וקבוצה של שותפים שיבחנו את היום שאחרי הקורונה, התסמינים שיישארו במערכת הלמידה, דיון רחב של קבוצה, של מומחים מהמוסדות. מחר יש לנו יום סדנאות נוסף ואתם כמובן מוזמנים להירשם, אני מתאר לעצמי שכבר עשיתם את זה רובכם. הכנס בחסות מגוון רחב של נותני חסות, חברות שעוסקות בתחום הלמידה המקוונת, למידה, טכנולוגיות למידה. בהפסקת הצהריים אנחנו פותחים חדר לכל נותן חסות ואתם מוזמנים להיכנס וללמוד, יש פה גם עולמות וירטואליים, אבל מגוון רחב של טכנולוגיות שכדאי שתיכנסו לחדרים ותלמדו ותראו מה הכלים שמציעים לנו. חלק גדול מהם גם נמצא בסל הטכנולוגיות, אז אנחנו אחר כך נמשיך איתם את הפעילות כמובן. ואני רוצה להגיד תודות, תודות לצוות מחב"א, לאודליה לבנון, לבנון מנכ"לית מחב"א, 
ולצוות מחב"א שעזר לנו להעמיד את הכנס הזה. לוועדת התוכנית של הכנס שליוותה אותנו עם כל האתגרים לאורך החודשים האחרונים, עשו עבודה נהדרת ואנחנו נראה את, התוכ... את התוכנית היום איך היא מתפרסת על כל היום הזה. כמובן לצוות מחב"א, פרופסור אהרון פלמון שמלווה אותנו שנים ותומך בכל דרך ורעיון של... שלנו לקדם. נדב קבלרצ'יק שנמצא פה בחדר ליד ועוזר לנו בהיבטים הטכניים, דוקטור ישי מור שנמצא כאן, אפרת בחר שושני, מיקי אוליאל ופרופסור עמנואל גרינגארד, כל אחד מהם נמצא כאן ברקע כדי לעזור לנו במושבים המקבילים. צוות מידע, מיטל עבד רבות בימים האחרונים כדי להעמיד את הכנס הזה, די מורכב יש לציין. Uh, ואנחנו רוצים uh, להתחיל, אז אנחנו כבר עוברים לדונלד. Uh, ו... Okay. אז תודה, so... ואני מקווה שיהיה לנו כנס מוצלח ומהנה. Uh, תודה. תודה רבה לאלי. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Donald Clark. Donald will talk about higher education, AI changes everything. Donald Clark from England, is an uh, EdTech entrepreneur, CEO, professor, researcher, blogger, and speaker. Describing himself as free from the tyranny of employment, he is a board member of the AI-focused company, Learning Pool. He is also visiting professor and involved in research into AI in learning. He has worked in schools, vocational, higher corporate, and adult learning, delivering real projects to real learners. Donald has over 30 years of experience in online learning, game simulations, semantic, adaptive chatbot, social media, mobile learning, virtual reality, and AI projects. So, Donald, please. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, Donald, um, Hi. good morning. You, you can good try morning. to share your screen and we'll see if it's work. If not, we will share yeah, it. Yeah, thing, yeah. No, it's same problem. It looks as though we're going to have to work it from your end. Is that okay? Donald? Hi. You? Yes, I can hear you. I've tried, but uh, unsuccessfully this end. So if you can operate it from your end, that would be fine. Donald, I cannot hear you. Ah. Can you hear me now? Okay. We can okay. hear Donald, I will share it. Okay, great. Um, before we, I'll, I'll, let's try just a minute to, okay, now you are co-host, let's try to share again, if not, we will, uh, we will start, yeah, no problem. Try to share again, if not, I will share it from here. Uh, no luck, so if we can share it from your end. Okay. Eli, that great. Thank you. I'll just cue you with the next slide. Yeah. Just a minute, we have a Okay. Perfect. Okay, you all can okay. see it? Good. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, and although I'm uh, calling you from England this morning, uh, some of you may recognize my accent. I'm actually from Scotland. So uh, like some of you, English is also my second language. Uh, but I'll speak slowly so that everyone can, uh, can understand me fully. I've shown you the slide just to give you a little bit of background because uh, I've spent all my adult life in online learning in one form or another. 
uh, in uh, companies and universities and so on. Uh, but for the last four to five years, I've focused very much on artificial intelligence in online learning and have a book which will be published in just four weeks now on artificial intelligence for learning. But I've been involved, I run an AI company, so uh, I do this stuff for real and I'm in three other companies involved in AI and learning. So that's my whole life. And uh, I can explain why in a moment. There's a lot of echo there, I'm not too sure why. That echo is quite bad. Is that my end? You could use the headphones, then it won't happen. Okay. okay. Headphones still happening. Is that okay? Hello. Yes, everything's fine. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, so the reason I put this uh, slide on uh, is that I think in higher education, in fact, in any area, AI changes everything. AI changes uh, life itself. Some people would argue that it's an existential threat. It's so serious. But it's certainly true that anything you do online, whether it's Facebook is mediated by AI, Twitter mediated by AI. Uh, beyond that, we can go into Netflix, which is mediated by AI. If you buy a book on Amazon, it's mediated by AI. Almost everything you do online is mediated by AI. Apart, of course, from a, the world of online learning. Now, this is a bit of a puzzle, really. A, why should online learning be immune from the charms of AI? And I, I think that's because we're stuck in a rut, really. We're stuck in a, you know, really the 1990s, 2000 client server model of media production with multiple choice questions very often. Next slide, please. I mean, one of the things that's also a problem in terms of the transition into a new piece of technology like the use of AI is the fact that we bring our old form of technology with us. This is a slide which was drawn in 1899 trying to predict what technology would be like in the year 2000. And of course, the artist is stuck in a mechanical world. And I think with AI, our mindset hasn't changed yet. Uh, we tend to think of AI in terms of robots. We bring that older view of the world and technology, uh, traditional web-based technology into the world of AI, which is largely invisible to us, which is why we make mistakes in simply bringing the lecture, for example, into this newer world without thinking about what the affordances of the new technology, namely AI, actually are. Next slide. Before, we, before I really get a start and give you some real examples, I think it's important to give you my view of what one might think of AI as before you regard it as a solution in online learning. And my first definition, which comes from a guy called Toby Walsh, is that AI is an idiot savant. In other words, it's very, very good at precise tasks, but it's absolutely hopeless at general uh, intelligent tasks such as being a teacher. So the idea that AI will replace teachers is slightly ridiculous in a sense. It's nowhere near replicating the full range of skills that a teacher has. However, it can outdo a teacher on certain narrow skills. And that's what I want to focus on today. Next slide. I think a second definition, uh, sorry, back one. A second definition, which comes from Daniel Dennett, uh, is that AI is competence without comprehension. And this is a terribly important point. In other words, whatever AI does in the area of online learning, it doesn't know anything. It may beat you at chess, it may beat you at poker or go, it doesn't even know it's won. 
You know, there's no self-consciousness, there's no intelligence in that human sense. And this is important because many people get carried away and almost anthropomorphize AI without realizing that it has none of those features. So remember, AI is an idiot savant, only good at narrow things, and it has no comprehension whatsoever. It's merely competent. And the competence is what I want to focus on. Next slide. So why is artificial intelligence the big issue now? Well, of course, we've had some amazing advances in the mathematics of AI in itself with deep, deep learning and neural networks and so on. But of course, we've also had the internet, which has given us not only devices and access to AI services, such as I've described, but also, of course, a, a tsunami of data. And it's this data that allows us to operate. Next slide. And just to give you an example of why I think you should be taking AI seriously, if we go back to the left-hand side of the slide and see what the top 10 companies by market cap were in 2006, you can see it's full of energy companies, banks, uh, by and large, with just uh, uh, one tech company, and that's Microsoft in there. If we jump 10 years to 2016 in the middle, we see the mm, Apple, Amazon, Facebook are making an appearance. But let's jump to this month. And you can see here that the top 10 are all tech companies. More than this, they're all really AI companies. Every single one of these companies has AI as their core strategy. This really does matter. Uh, so to ignore AI and learning is to ignore the technology of the age. Uh, because this is coming, it will come, and resistance in a sense is futile. Okay, next slide. And the next slide, thank you. Okay, now let's just take something off the table straight away and that's the concept of AI as a teacher. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I got a message saying I was muted. Yes. Okay. The, the first thing I would say is the, the myth of the robot teacher. So we have attended many conferences over the last few years where I've had to co-host with another speaker who's normally been a robot. DevLearn was a good example in the, in the US last year. And of course, this is a slightly ridiculous idea that any of these things could be of any use other than perhaps in a children's kindergarten setting in terms of education. Certainly not in higher education. Next slide. But we have, of course, in a sense, AI has crept in through the back door. So we have a uh, page and brain of Google up on the left hand side, AI guys by background, and who doesn't use Google, who doesn't use Google Scholar, who doesn't search for YouTube videos using their technology, which is really page rank, a Bayesian equation. Uh, we have Can, who comes from a maths AI background on the top right, one of the great pioneers in maths education. Sebastian Thrun, bottom left, uh, the, uh, you know, the founder of a, a major MOOC company. It's worth about a billion, an AI researcher from Google and Stanford. And then we have uh, Andrew Nigg and Daphne Kohler, both AI specialists at Stanford, uh, uh, behind Coursera, and then Artwell from uh, MIT and Harvard. So AI expertise is already here in this landscape and is reshaping the landscape. Notice the background of these people. This is very different from educational departments in a traditional higher education setting. The landscape has actually been changed by people with, from AI backgrounds. Next slide. Uh, what I'd like to do now is get down to the nuts and bolts of the presentation, which is to take you across the learning journey and show you how AI can affect each one of these things from learner engagement right through to assessment, touching upon support, content creation, and adaptive learning in the middle. Next slide. So let's look at these five things here. You know, these are the five things typically one might do as when we're teaching a, a course in a university, you know, answering learners' questions and queries right through to assessment. And I'll go through these one by one. Let's start with the first and easiest one and see how AI has affected that. That's number one, next slide. And the next slide. Of course, we are, we're all familiar with Google. 
20 years. PageRank is that tiny little equation at the top here, which founded one of the most uh, successful and valuable companies on the planet. Uh, and that is a little Bayesian equation, a little piece of AI. And uh, that's what gave you Google Scholar. That's what allows you also to search uh, things on YouTube. So it's already there, but it's online. Nothing to do with robots, but incredibly powerful. Uh, if I remember my, doing my PhD, and that was a long time ago, I think I spent three or four months of that three years just wandering up and down looking for paper journals and books. Uh, one could argue that you should take three to four months off a modern PhD because you have tools like Google Scholar and access, of course, to online materials. I don't know if that would happen, however. Next slide. Uh, another big effect that AI has had on is, of course, on your user interface. I have behind me, uh, I won't say the word A-L-E-X-A, -E or it will spark it off, uh, but we have voice, we have the interface, which most people use when they access, let's say, Facebook or Netflix, which is behind the scenes, AI is constantly predicting what you do next, either on predictive text or what you might want to see on your screen. So AI really is shaping your user interface. And I think this should be true as I'll show you in learning as well. Next slide. Uh, some of those interfaces I've already mentioned, but who can deny the success of everything from Google Assistant through to Amazon uh, ALEXA, uh, Siri, Cortana. Voice is becoming incredibly important. And I've been using voice quite, uh, quite seriously in the online learning recently where a student would typically, if you were an academic, a member of faculty asking a question in voice, they would reply using voice. But it's strange that online learning is, in a sense, stuck in the world of text. You know, it will only accept typing those big, uh, you know, pieces of meat, as Elon Musk uh, would call them, which is a rather inefficient, frictionful uh, interface. Perhaps that voice is one of the areas which will transcend this. Next slide. Uh, I'll touch a little bit upon learning analytics because it's not, AI is both algorithmic and driven by data, but sometimes there's maybe too much emphasis in the data. If we go back to the pure sense of learning analytics, and this is a very simple uh, model here, uh, one can go through these. The mistake that most people make, and I see this often in higher education, is that one spends tens of thousands of dollars, but is really stuck at level one. In other words, you're harvesting descriptive data, which is what people do, what they clicked on, what they looked at, when they stopped. Uh, you may do some analysis here. You may uh, get some little insights about the average or mean uh, length that someone spends on a course or whatever. But this is really stuck in what I'd call the world of the dashboard. It's almost like having a car where you only have the dashboard, but you don't have the engine. And I feel that AI and learning analytics is very much stuck in a cul-de-sac here because actually most people in terms of analytics are using data to do the two on the right-hand side, to either predict what's going to happen. In other words, I'm going to predict what I think you may buy on my site, Amazon, or what you might want to watch on Netflix, and I provide you with those options. We very rarely do that in uh, learning analytics in learning, or even better, to automate or prescribe and determine what people are going to do. And this is commonly done in adaptive learning, and I'll show you some examples of this shortly. But I think the danger with learning analytics is we gather stuff and forget that it's really about decision making. It's about what you want the student to do or you as a teacher to do next. And dashboards are never enough. Next slide. Uh, in a sense, you have to think about your or technical and also pedagogic architecture in terms of this learning experience layer at the top, mediated by AI, the stuff in the middle, which is all your content, teaching, delivery, and so on. But the important thing is the third one down the bottom, this data and insights layer, and how you loop that back into the learning experience and content side. Next slide. And remember, this is quite complicated. This is one small diagram uh, of how one brings in third party content, uh, you know, your own content, using the data and insights in a specialist tool called Learning Locker. I know you've played around with this, but if you're going to use data, it's not trivial. You have to get the data in the right format if it's going to be usable, and you'll come across many problems along the way. But you have to think on a big scale if you're going to do this properly. Most institutions don't actually have big data 
learning data tends to be relatively small sets of data, so don't be too ambitious about machine learning and some of the more esoteric sides of AI. Next slide. I, I wanted to show you this because it's something that took the imagination of a lot of kids in the UK and America, and it's a little app on your phone. So if you're teaching maths, Every 13-year-old in the UK has this on their smartphone. You simply show your smartphone the maths problem. If you have a maths homework problem, you look at your screen and it gives you the answer. Now, how cool is that if you're 13 years old and you want to be playing football outside in the street? Uh, but the really important point, you may teachers really hate this application, but they're wrong because there's a steps button which allows you to explode the steps between the question and the answer, which is where all the teaching takes place. I used to teach maths, and this is a tool I would have loved to have had as a teacher. So AI is getting quite sophisticated, even down at that app level, and it's already creeping into the onto the desktops or smart screens of, of teenagers. Next screen. Let's look at learner engagement and support, which is a big deal. Uh, next screen. I think the first thing is, again, in this creep in through the back door, if you've been using plagiarism software, you'll notice that some of these companies, Turnitin is one of many examples, are starting to use AI in a more positive sense, allowing students to submit work. And then we have these, uh, uh, you know, essay analyzers, which really help the student. This, this is using AI. It really helps the student write better. That's what should happen rather than just I mean, isn't it odd that in higher education, the only place one is likely to find AI is in plagiarism checking? It's almost bizarre. But of course, the plagiarism checkers are now not only providing uh, really good feedback on writing skills so that you can improve your essay as you go forward, or your written word, but also some really good food feedback, even on maths uh, and more sophisticated STEM subjects, as you can see at the bottom. Next slide. And then, of course, we have the rise of the chatbot. And there are many of these out. Uh, the ones I know of are mostly in the UK and the US. But on the left-hand side, there are a whole number of universities using this to recruit students uh, and really filtering whether the student is suitable, what course they want to take, and then automatically routing them through to student financing. And this is a way in which your institution can, if you're looking to recruit and it is a competitive landscape even more so with covid perhaps then these have become quite normal in some universities every year which is what students want to see and then in the middle a more interesting set of chatbots around support and that was what happens when a student arrives on campus or even is online and they want to know exactly where the services are or who to who to contact if they have a problem, or perhaps want to meet other students of a, a like mind. That's what Differ does. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we're seeing chatbots arise in the delivery of learning itself. In other words, dialogue, not monologue. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Next slide. OK, so chatbots for learning. There are many species of this. I've showed you recruitment bots, uh, onboarding bots. And those when you first arrive at your institution, getting you aware of things that are available. There is the learner engagement stuff on the course, perhaps, or in the department to grab the student's attention and keep and hold them. Learning support bots right through to practice and assessment, even well-being bots at the bottom here. Next slide. Uh, this is one uh, which is actually a corporate example, but there are other examples like this in higher education. That's SAP, a large uh, German tech company. Uh, next slide. I show this because they were one of the few who really did evaluate this in detail. In other words, they're using chatbots to deliver learning and to deliver questions from trainees, call them students for a moment. And they compared interactions with a bot on the left-hand side with what they had, which were people on the end of telephones on the right-hand side. And you'll notice that the interaction with the bot and the usefulness of the bot scored nine and nine respectively compared to the eight, seven, six, and five on the right-hand side. So we have proof that students, uh, learners sometimes prefer the machine to uh, the live person. And uh, this is a rather unusual finding, but we shouldn't be surprised at this. I prefer taking my cash from an ATM rather than walking into the bank and speaking to a person. Uh, we've long preferred technology to people if we really want a quick answer to a question. Next slide. 
And this, of course, is perhaps the most famous bot of all at Georgia Tech, uh, where on a course with 350 students, and these were AI students, so these are pretty straight grade A students, uh, they had a massive database of 40,000 queries, which they had taken historically from students, and I was student emails to faculty. That's about four years work for a teacher, by the way. And a rather interesting thing happened. They had nine teaching assistants. They swapped one out for a chatbot, a piece of AI effectively. And a strange thing happened. Next slide. The students actually put the chatbot up for a teaching award. Now, this came as a bit of a shock to the faculty, but the reason for this was quite clear. If you had a query about your assignment, what library in Python do I, you need to use in this topic, uh, then the bot would respond immediately, as opposed to the hours, sometimes a couple of days before the faculty member might reply by email. It wasn't only super quick. In fact, it was so quick they had to slow the response down by putting a delay in to make it seem as though someone was typing. That's how good it was. But secondly, of course, it was consistent, never accusatory. Uh, and so in some narrow domains, remember the AI is an idiot savant, in a precise domain like assignments on this AI course, the bot worked wonders. Next slide. In fact, in year two, uh, an even more interesting experiment was tried where two further bots were launched, one a little bit more social. And even though those kids had experienced one year of a bot, only 50% identified the, the first one as AI and only 16 the second. But the really interesting point was that some thought that two of the real teachers, real faculty members, were actually AI bots. So there was this sort of confusion or cognitive confusion between what was a bot and what was a teacher. So you can see this technology sort of creeping towards really good functionality if that was the case. It was almost like a, a Turing test of sorts. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about delivery of learning for a moment then, which is a big one. Now, for the last few years, I've been working on, uh, on projects like this, and this is one which, uh, which is, allows you to take a document, let's say a PDF in your course, or a PowerPoint that you use in a lecture hall, or a podcast, or a video of your lecture, you put it into an AI tool, in this case called Wildfire, and it outputs online learning automatically. Next slide. And there are all sorts of areas one can use AI in terms of the production of content. Uh, you can pre-see content. In other words, if you have a, a huge 20,000 word PDF on a topic and you want to pre-seed down to something that's more suitable for learning, then you can use AI to do that, either keeping the original sentences intact, uh, there's an extractive and abstractive form of AI uh, pre-seeing, or you can have it rewarded in many ways. Or you can use AI, as it says at the top, to create online audio, in other words, not just text, but speech. So straightforward AI text to speech can be used. Uh, you can analyze answers. I mean full sentences as opposed to clicking on a multiple choice question. You can have the semantic interpretation of a student answer, which is a great leap forward from normal Moodle delivered uh, online learning and implementing things like spaced practice, retrieval practice and chatbots. These are all precise things that AI allows you to do without going into the full intelligent teacher form of AI. Next slide. Uh, in this case, let's suppose it's a lecture top left and video, you watch the video, and then on the bottom, bottom right hand side, the AI is producing and allowing you to type in answers or your thoughts on a topic and give semantic analysis of the answer. It's just one of the many things that AI can do. Next slide. Okay, let's move. This is a big one, adapt to learners, adaptive learning. Next slide, please. Now, traditional, this is already, uh, I've been involved in this in four years at Arizona State University, and that university liked this platform so well, they invested a large seven-figure sum in the platform. This is almost unknown for a university to invest in a tech online learning platform, and that's because it worked. They took their time, they spent four or five years really seeing if the software works, and what you do is break your content down into learning objects and work out the probabilities uh, or weightings between those objects. Uh, so if I go to the next slide. Each learner, in a sense, vectors through this content in a unique and personal way. Let's suppose this was maths, then you do not move on to, to keep it simple, you wouldn't move on to multiplication if you didn't know anything about subtraction and addition. 
Now, what the software does here, the AI, in a sense, is a bit like your GPS or sat-nav. It's an intelligent tutor that sits on the side of this. And just if you were driving from, let's say, Jerusalem to Tel Aviv and you took a wrong turning and your sat-nav or GPS would get you back on course, well, the AI does exactly the same in adaptive learning. It gets you back on course, but it knows who you are, where you are on your journey, and exactly how to get you back on course, as opposed to just getting stuck, which is what happens to most people in mathematics. They get stuck and they never progress without real help. So and this is adaptive learning and is being used in anger in many universities, especially in the US and China at the moment. Next slide. And uh, I can send you a lot of detail on this, but this is just one summary slide where you can see that as we started using this, you see that the attainment, the green line, actually rises quite considerably. But the orange line, the withdrawal from the course, also starts to fall. Of course, there's a, a correlation between those two. If you have higher attainment, you get less dropout. But this is important because in the 101 undergraduate courses, the problem in the US is huge dropout. And people still have a one-year loan, and it's catastrophic for them. They have no degree, and they have a student loan. So keeping people, getting them through that 101 course in biology, psychology, writing, math, US history, we've done all of those topics is terribly important because it's quite predictive in terms of them completing the degree. Next slide. Uh, so you can see that 50% reduction, and these are from ASU faculty members themselves, ASU building the first adaptive degree. Now, this is interesting. Not only have they used it on 101 courses, they think that the platform and the technique is so powerful, they can deliver a whole degree using adaptive learning. Next slide. And indeed, that's been launched. It's called the ASU Biospine. Now, I want you to look at this diagram on the right-hand side, because the advantage of AI, remember going back to learning analytics, is as the student goes through the degree, you're harvesting data about all the courses they take. And then using that data, not only the aggregated data from all students, but the individual data from that individual student in a personalized sense, and taking that data and applying it in all future events on the course. So in a sense, the course is self-improving, gathering data, improving for the student experience, especially making it more personalized. So we have the launch of this adaptive. I think this is going to be, I mean, I don't really understand why universities don't. This is a very low cost for students. You can actually buy these courses, uh, you know, 101 psychology, 101 biology. And in these times when uh, money's tight, perhaps this is a better route to take rather than building every course from scratch by every faculty member. Perhaps we should think about doing what other areas of human endeavor do, and that's get scalable by not building everything from a blank sheet of paper. Next slide, please. Uh, other AI techniques, uh, Sentry uh, is another that's uh, quite commonly used in the UK. Again, the data from this is interesting. This is adaptive learning again. This has been used a lot in our technical colleges or further education on vocational courses especially getting kids up to speed on maths and English, because those, again, are necessary conditions for success in many other subjects. Next slide. And you can see it's personalized data. And it's not that this dashboard matters, it's what the courses actually deliver in terms of content next. Next slide. And don't imagine that this is just in, uh, in the US, uh, there are Huge sums of money being invested in China at the moment in adaptive learning systems. Squirrel AI just raised $159 million. Uh, they have huge numbers of people in schools and now coming into universities using adaptive learning, exactly the same, similar technology, but heavily driven by sort of Bayesian prediction in AI. Next slide. And what's interesting now is we're at the phase where the evidence is coming through of its efficacy. In other words, how does it match up or how does it help a teacher teach? What improvements do we get in student attainment? Next slide. So the last one is assessing learners. Let's uh, next slide on this one. Now, this has become critical during COVID, of course, uh, because we have had to assess learners at a distance. So we've started to use AI technology in quite an interesting way. Next slide. Of course, you can do a, I mean, it's been around in Coursera, the keyword, uh, the keyboard uh, checking. And I was, I have a unique fingerprint. And if I type in a paragraph, when I sit at the exam, it knows that it's me, Donald, taking the exam. 
That's actually not AI, it's a very simple sort of rule base bit of code to do that. But you may want to check whether the student is the right student at a distance. So we have face recognition against ID, we have fingerprint recognition, all sorts of techniques that are used on checking identity. Next slide. Uh, so not just identity, however, what's really interesting about some of the stuff at a distance is the audio analysis. In other words, is somebody whispering the answers to the student in the room? That's now done when you record this stuff. There's also analysis of the recorded video to see if there's any gait or posture difference in terms of cheating uh, by looking at things on the floor and so on. Uh, at a more serious level, some also involve eye tracking. Uh, now, this may seem worry some people in terms of privacy, but nevertheless, if you want full verification of whether someone's not cheating, then some of these techniques may be useful. But these are actually used in real proctoring systems as we speak. Next slide. Uh, AI and plagiarism, let's come back to plagiarism again, because I, you know, plagiarism software is okay, but it's got rather weak, especially as students are starting to buy essays and essay mills. This is a, a plague in all of our houses, but we're getting a, a situation now where similarity stylometry, the last one's interesting there, and I was, if you identify the style of previous work by that student, you can tell whether they've bought an essay from an essay mill, because it will not be in the style of the student. We have citation analysis and then AI techniques like bag of words analysis, which really does go to town on any written submission by a student. We're getting very sophisticated at this now. There are all sorts of areas in natural language processing that allow us to do plagiarism checking in more detail and more fairly. Next slide. And then I don't want to worry you, but <laughs> the OpenAI, which was started by Elon Musk uh, a year and a half ago, uh, launched what you're seeing here, which is a thing called GPT-2, it's an AI model. And on the website, I had this very interesting example. In other words, for today's homework assignment, please describe the reasons for the US Civil War. They simply plugged that sentence into GPT-2, and it came up with an essay. This is the first pass essay. And it actually is quite readable. It's not perfect. But this should worry us, because we're on the verge, and they've now re re released an even uh, you know, an order of magnitude better, GTP3, we're reaching a situation where kids may be able to type in simple assignments and get them done in literally a second or two by having on tap access to very powerful AI machines which do the writing for them, uh, even cutting out the essay mill. We're nowhere near that yet, but that's what we're facing going forward. Next slide. And if some of you are worried about the, the ethical issues here, all I'd say is, you know, don't worry too much about this. AI is not as good as you think it is, and it's not as bad as you fear. I think there's a great deal of anthropomorphism around in this world, and we, AI is only software. It's an extension of software. And I think there are privacy issues. And there are issues around bias. But even on bias, AI, humans are biased. Uh, we wonder sometimes what our benchmark is here. We're all racist. We're all sexist. Uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, got Nobel Prize for finding out our biases. And interestingly, in the last page of his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, he does actually say they're uneducable. In other words, we can't get rid of those biases. We just have to have behavioral training, so we suppress them in a sense. Next slide. So let me finish on that statement. I've taken you across the whole learning journey, showing how AI is starting to touch each of those points from learning engagement, support, chatbots, learning content, assessment, even well-being, if I had time, we could go into that. But I think we're at a juncture here. We have to get out of the trap of simply having an LMS in which we dump slides, recording of lectures, and start doing what the rest of the world is doing. Now, this is a double-edged sword, and like the god Shiva, you know, it's both creative and destructive. We have to be careful about the ethical issues. On the other hand, we as educators have a fantastic opportunity here to make a leap so that the software we're using starts to become as sophisticated as some of our teaching techniques. And the only way we're going to do this is by using smart software, not software that just presents videos, presents media, occasionally peppered with multiple choice questions. I think AI is the key to opening up this future whereby we are using smart software to make students smarter, used by faculty, of course. None of this is replacing teachers. That's a terribly important point. 
So let me end on that point, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, so thank you, Donald. Uh, questions, please. Can I can I ask a question? Sure. Um, can you give us maybe a a um, sneak preview? How do you see AI developing in the next five years? You gave us a. Uh, what's happening now, but AI it, in itself will develop. How do you see it developing? Okay, well, the one thing I'd say is we're not going to have an AI winter. Uh, I think uh, there were AI winters, all the research dried up, but this is so deeply embedded in the commercial world through large tech companies. Every one of them have, has AI as a strategic uh, goal. And it's in our, all of our lives. If you have a smartphone, if you're on this, or not on a laptop watching Zoom at the moment, or, you know, it's there. It's operating all the time, whether it's preventing spam, if you watch preventing pornography appearing on YouTube, uh, or on all the examples I've given you here. But I think the important point going forward is the big area is NLP, natural language processing. And that's where all the big leaps are being made. I mentioned the GPT-3 that was just released by OpenAI. But you've seen how good translation is starting to get. You've seen how good the predictive mechanisms on Amazon and Netflix and other media are. If the question was about how it's going to happen in learning, well, I think the technology is always ahead of the sociology that's always ahead of the pedagogy. We're always the last to jump on board of a new piece of technology because the, the practices are so deep, you know, habitual practice and practice. Uh, practical issues within colleges are all built really around the lecture, which is still a fundamental pedagogic technique. This is the truth almost globally. And uh, if we keep on building lecture theatres, uh, then the money is going in the wrong direction, I feel. But now COVID has certainly let us into the future. So I think we'll see an acceleration of the adoption of some of the techniques I've mentioned here, but it will be a slow burn in HE. It will be much faster in corporate learning and also in schools, I feel. Uh, higher education has more uh, cultural barriers uh, uh, to, to, such a, to, to such progress, but it will happen. Resistance is futile. There's one thing I would add, which is some very interesting stuff happening around, you know, the, and it, this sounds like science fiction, but we know from some studies that you can affect the brain in this way, around non-invasive and invasive techniques and reading EEG and so on. In other words, can you actually track how a student learns and optimize learning? by keeping them on task. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting things happening on that area, but it gets very, <laughs> it gets very invasive in terms of privacy and ethical issues very quickly, that one. But that may be something that surprises us. I hope that answered that question. Thank you. More questions, please? Hi, hi Donald. Oh, sorry, hi. go on. Um, Donald. You talked about uh, social networks uh, using AI, and uh, I was wondering if not precisely the AI, but the psychological uh, triggers and hooks they use, uh, is there a way to transform them into uh, learning? So I had the real bad echo and even on my headphones. Can you just repeat the first sentence you said there? Yeah, I talked about uh, using psychological hooks and it's not per, uh, AI per se, but uh, it, uh, it, do you see that uh, in use in uh, learning today? Is it, I, I didn't catch what you, what, what, did you say books? Hooks. Hooks, psychological hooks. You oh, mentioned this. Sorry, got you. Yeah, good question. I think it certainly is. In fact, over the last two years, I've been involved in a project using a thing called an LXP, LX learning experience platform, where you're gathering data in real time about individual learners, and then the, using AI or an algorithmic prediction process to automatically deliver nudges and hooks and use what in a sense almost marketing techniques to hook people into the learning process through student engagement. This has become quite normal in LXPs through alerts, nudges, or targeting very specific learning experiences 
at the moment of need for a student. In other words, you know what the context may be, you know what course they're on, where they are in the course, and you know exactly what they need at that point, either during an assignment uh, or generally in the course. That, in a sense, is what adaptive learning does, but LXP platforms do that in a more marketing sense, you know, by giving students alerts. Have you thought about looking at this video and so on? Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think that we will move now to the second part of our meeting to the rooms. So please, uh, Ellie, maybe you will explain them. Okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Donald. Um, and we now will switch to Hebrew and um, we will continue the conference. So thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Chavarim, we are continuing the program of the KNS. What will be us for all the is the program. The program is... The program is... We can go to the different rooms. We will begin in five uh, שוב, כל הלינקים מופיעים לכם בתוכנית, אתם יכולים לגשת לסשן שבחרתם ופשוט ללחוץ, uh, uh, ללחוץ עליו uh, כניסה, <coughs> יש שם את הכישורים המתאימים. Uh, ואנחנו נמשיך לפי התוכנית את כל היום, אז אתם uh, מוזמנים, זו קונת קצרה של חמש דקות ואנחנו ממשיכים בסשנים המקבילים. <coughs> יפה. <coughs> אם, uh, אם יש uh, שאלות או uh, לגבי המשך <coughs> היום, <coughs> אז אתם מוזמנים. מוזמנים לשאול אותנו כרגע, או בחדר קבלה שמופיע לכם באיגרת ששלחנו. החדר הזה מיועד לאיזה מושב? סליחה? החדר פה מיועד לאיזה מהמושבים? הוא אמור, אני מציע שתצאו ותיכנסו שוב דרך הלינקים המסודרים. הוא יהיה לאחד המושבים, אבל אני לא זוכר בדיוק לאיזה מושב. פשוט לצאת מהמושב הזה, להיכנס לחדש. כן, רק שנניח עכשיו... בעוד חמש דקות. רק שעכשיו כתוב, The host has another meeting in progress. אז אם זה המושב הזה... יכול להיות. פשוט לצאת, להיכנס, וזה כבר יכניס אתכם למושב המושב. איך אני עושה את זה? And or leave meeting בצד ימין ואתם uh, uh, יוצאים ונכנסים לתוכנית ומשם פנימה לסשן הבא. <laughs> 